Well, thank you everyone for coming this evening. This was a great opportunity to talk about two of my favorite topics, which is human-centered design, which I've been practicing for many years, and autonomous vehicles, which are just coming out at the moment. The UK is very much in the lead in this area, whether it's the Center for Connected Autonomous Vehicles, CCAV, whether it's the Transport Catapult, whether it's Connected Cities. The UK is a bit at the forefront of autonomous technology, and the two coming together provides an opportunity to have a look at how the design process gets flipped when you move away from a technology push or market pull innovation model and look at it instead purely from the point of view of the punters. The people in this room are the people who will be using these autonomous vehicles, it's not the chap over in the Midlands who's designing the current vehicle. So the, the opportunity tonight is to take a look how everything can flip. Now I don't really have much time given the tight schedule to talk much about human centered design, but there's a couple things, just one or two I need to be fully clear about because there's various flavors and types of definitions around the world. When I'm referring to human centered design, I'm, human, I'm referring to all those UX, design, ethnography, sociology and psychology activities which interact with people, probe them, probe their conscious, probe their subconscious, view their behavior, try to understand them. And at the end of the day, if you do it properly, you usually end up with the people you're working with digging out a better understanding of what they like and they want than they knew before they actually came to you for this activity. And in one sentence, as a strap line, what we're talking about is a form of structured empathy. Everyone in this room has empathy to some degree. It's a natural thing. It's a human condition. It's something we're hardwired in our brain to do. But it's one thing for each of us to feel and understand our grandma, our neighbor, the person sitting next to us. It's a totally different thing as an organization. I work a lot with Jaguar Land Rover in the Midlands. They have many thousands of staff. Organizationally, how do you get the tick boxes and the lists in order and look at it from a design perspective such that the design process itself, the UX process, step by step, the ergonomic checks are empathic in their nature and in their findings. And if you do it, you usually more or less to some degree end up with things which are here at the bottom line, intuitive frictionless in UX terminology. If we do things carefully and exhaustively, hopefully for the general public and the punters to some degree the process will end up being frictionless. So the kinds of themes and topics and things we talk about are these. Lots and lots and lots of human factors and ergonomics. They're, they're, they're the science bit. They're the bread and butter everyday activities. But lots of interactivity analysis, quite a bit of semiotics and aesthetics, and at the top of the triangle we always put in our research team the question of meaning. For thousands of years we've struggled to do things. Humanity is now in a position where we can do most things if we throw enough money at it. The question becomes what we want to do. What's right, what's wrong, what do the people actually benefit from, what is that just a commercial opportunity that's short term, long term, what's going on. We to some extent can play God we're in a rich world, most people go to school, most people are educated, technology is exploding and cr growing exponentially. Now the question, much more than the past, becomes not how are we going to do it, but what is it that we're all agreeing we're going to do, and is it ethical, is it defensible, is it legal, is it all the other considerations which make us human beings and make our society. And autonomous vehicles, you see them on TV all the time, lots and lots of stuff going on from semi-autonomous capabilities and automatisms from Tesla to various things going on at Greenwich or at Heathrow Airport more locally. We've got pods, we've got delivery vehicles, we've got Amazon wanting to fly drones over heads, we got all kinds of lovely things going on. Very challenging systems, but the neural networks, the expert systems, the algorithms and the technologies are advancing exponentially. There's no doubt that the thing will drive properly in some years time. It's a question of time. The real question becomes what do we want it to do? and what will we accept and what will we be happy with. And one of the first issues that very rarely is discussed in any of the motor manufacturers, very rarely discussed over at the Catapult or even in CCAV, is the question of anthropomorphism. And yet we see it on social media all the time. We see people treating 
uh, social media, treating algorithms, chatbots, apps, and autonomous vehicles in an anthropomorphic way. Our brain has structures in it to look for faces and see if they're smiling or not. It's automatic. We cannot turn it off. It's in the subconscious. It's above the cog it's below, excuse me, the cognitive processing level. We are empathic, emotional, anthropomorphizing creatures. Our way of projecting and deciding what the car will do will be, I wonder what a dog or a cat would do. Maybe the car is going to do the same thing at that junction. This is the way we're naturally wired to think. So there's a question of, when you design this thing, are you going to take advantage of that and go with it and do something with it and to what degree? Or are we going to try to avoid it because that could be confusing and lead to misunderstandings and things like that? And it's a big question because there is the tendency to automatically, in our subconscious, attribute intentions, motivations and reasons why did that thing fall off the table? There's a reason for that. We're seeking motivations and intentionalities even in the most inanimate objects in our lives. So there is a real question of, are we going to let the people judge the vehicle that way or not? Should we design with it? or we should we design against it? And in the world of design, it's a big issue. All of those manufacturers who make robots, they have to ask themselves the question, for example, any kind of robot in a factory or an assembly plant or a machine situation in a hospital or whatever, you have to ask yourself, if it needs to have a camera and some sensors or whatever, sort of a head of some sort on top, what is the design space of it? Is it abstract? Is it iconic? Is it human? If we make it more human-like, there's the uncanny valley. It gets spooky, it can upset people. If we make it too machine-like, we may not interact with it, we may st stay away from it, we may not work with it. If it's in a hospital and we don't work with it, what's going to happen? So there's real questions already today with robotics about the degree of anthropomorphism and the strategy the designer, the UX designer, the product designer, the service designer, is going to set for their particular design and it's absolutely fundamental. It's not, a, it's not a trivial afterthought. It's a very serious issue. For example, a company that develops medical delivery robots, they put some of these little devices into their hospitals, into their warehouses, whatever. If the machine is doing something, oh Betsy made a mistake, if it's called Betsy, if they called the robot Betsy when they introduced it to the place, if they didn't give it a name but called it the X45, people, the staff are saying this stupid machine doesn't work. It changes the expectations, it changes the customer satisfaction, it changes the degree of interactivity, it changes the degree of dynamics, it changes everything about the reception the staff in the medical facility have, just whether the device was given a name and looked more uh, human-like or not. What about male-female? Statistics say that about 70% of the navigators, Google, uh, the ones from Apple, uh, previously TomTom Tom and Garmin and other devices, 70% roughly in Europe of the navigators are set to female voices. They're not set to male voices. Why is that? Research has shown because society tends to see Females is more caring, more empathic, mums going to take care of us. And we're setting our navigators and our chatbots when we go to buy tickets for the West End show. Most of the chatbots are also set to female voices as well. So from a UX point of view, the gender of the device, whether it be a chatbot, a computer interface, an app, or an autonomous vehicle, it's absolutely fundamental decision that needs to be made and needs to be intentionally stuck to all across the design process. And then what about driving? Do you trust the device or not? There's been lots of work looking at more anthropomorphized or less anthropomorphized autonomous taxis or vehicles, whether it's anthropomorphic, meaning given a name, a gender, and a voice, or left to look more like a box a robot thing from the 1950s, that changes completely the trust people have. And I think it's very easy to understand that. Trust in automation is one of the hot topics at the moment. Everyone's concerned about in the design community, in the ergonomic community, in the engineering community. Well, trust can be broken down into specific constructs. There are contextual factors which affect the trust you have in the automation in your car, on your cell phone, in your aircraft, or so forth. There's behavioral issues. 
how does this new robot thingy in my Tesla compare to how a good old-fashioned taxi driver would have done it? And then there's societal issues. Is this ethical? Would I allow a human being to say that to me? No. So why did I let the, the bloody navigator tell me that? Don't like that. So there's a whole series of issues related to trust and trust in automation, trust in chatbots, trust in robotics, trust in everything, medical devices. Trust is becoming very rapidly one of the main driving factors in product and service design. Trust is very heavily affected by anthropomorphism. The choice you make there has a big implications as to how you go in terms of the actual details of your design. And so much of the trust then ends up spilling over into the more ethical context. In 2016, British Standards emitted a new standard which was for the ethical designs of robots and autonomous systems. It's a lovely document, very extensive one. I've only chopped out one little piece of one little table from this very extensive piece of work. The question of the ethics of our robotic partners, our autonomous cars and our work companions is going to be a very important one. And I think you can see from some of the things that are in this table that the question of whether you go with an anthropomorphized approach or not, if you want to emphasize the fact it's a spanner, it's a tool, it's just a cog, it doesn't have any thinking ability, you can see how some of the things in this table, dehumanizing the humans, the robot does more than it was expected or allowed to do and so forth. You can see how every single column or every single row in this table would change dramatically depending on whether you were trying to achieve something more anthropomorphic, something with a face, something that reminds you more of a cat or a dog or a horse, or something that looks more like a machine, a wheelbarrow or some sort of boxy square thing. It's a very big interaction design choice. Thus, the very first thing, if we flip the point of view from that of the technologist to the people who have to use it, is are you offering me a non-thinking tool? Is it just the airport shuttle which goes from A to B stupidly all day long? Or are you actually going to drive me up the M1 at 80 miles an hour in the middle of the night taking risks to get me to hospital? Which one is it? And if it is one or the other, is everything the designer has done and everything the engineering and the user testing teams have done consistent with checking to make sure that everything falls into that pattern or that stereotype has been chosen for the design? And then looking in detail what that then leads to once you've made that choice, what about the name? Names are usually things which with most products and services get assigned quite late in the process. Not in the concept phase, quite often even after the user testing phase. Names in many businesses across the world, including in our fine city, are something of an afterthought that the branding and innovation team might look at towards the end of the process. Bit of a mistake because the name has a huge effect on what's going on. For example, lots of research in psychology and sociology for the last 50, 60 years has shown over and over again how certain names we use every day that we read in the newspaper, such as in the Fine Telegraph, certain names we will assume are nice people, very warm and caring, and some names, rightly or wrongly, because of how they're used in the media, because of how we've encountered them in our life every day at the shop, how our friends at school behaved, some names are considered less reliable, less friendly, less whatever. So when I give a name to the shuttle at Heathrow, I gotta be careful. I don't wanna give it a name that's gonna offend people or scare them off. And it gets even worse. It's not just in the name as an individual person might be associated with our life experiences, but it then gets political and it gets assigned to cultural groups. If it's a BMW and has a German name, I might just view it differently from a Jaguar Land Rover with an English name if I'm living in London. And again, in terms of UX, we have to be very careful how we choose these names for given cities, given scenarios, given markets. Because just the name sets a series of expectations. It even sets how easy it is to pass something like the Turing test, which is a right technical test. Meaning, what is this autonomous vehicle supposed to do? If instead of saying, I can put an electric motor to do this and I can put a neural network to do that, instead of talking about what I can do, we say, what should it do? What do people in this room want? Some people in this room will probably want an autonomous vehicle to go to work. 
go from A to B. It's a very functional thing. Some things in life, it doesn't matter so much what it looks like or how it works, I just got to get it done. I got to get my, my meal on the table at dinner tonight. But other people, in other situations, there could be rituals. Maybe I need the car to give me the ability to go to play soccer with my six-year-old child on a Sunday. And if it can't keep the ball in the gear and the stuff in the boot, the autonomous vehicle won't do the job I need. There's rituals in my life. People live by rituals. Actions people take, like chatting at the coffee machine, sends all kinds of messages about who we are, what we like, who our friends are, what we want to achieve with our life, and so forth and so on. And again, as a design concern, we must identify the key ones for the given autonomous vehicle. And then finally, myths. There are values in our life. Sitting in a museum looking at a piece of art has no functional, obvious, externally visible manifestation to it, but it's doing something for me. There's something being transmitted, I'm enjoying something, I'm thinking something. There's certain values, whether they be aesthetic, ethical, semiotic, or others, which I might wish to exchange, share, and participate in. Again, what's the autonomous vehicle doing for me? Is it the one I'm going to use for my holiday in Tuscany this summer, and it's going to be the ideal platform for sharing that aesthetic sensory immersion, or is it the one to get me to the meeting tonight by 7.15 at the launch? It's a very different proposition. After we, as human-centered designers, have asked questions about the anthropomorphism, then we've discussed a little bit what kind of names might work, and then we've asked some questions about is this 70% getting to work and 30% doing something on the weekend with the family? We then have the question of the metaphor, which is very rarely discussed in the motor industry when referring to autonomous vehicles. We all know Everyone in this room has been exposed to certain traditional metaphors, whether it be personal transport, rental car, taxi, or company car. We're all familiar with this, probably most of us have ridden in one. But there's new ones. Public shuttles, mobility service for the elderly or the disabled. Autonomous vehicles can go pick up a person who's blind and take them somewhere in a way that a normal vehicle could never do. And even a taxi driver might not be the ideal solution for that particular customer. Mobile offices, people with autonomous vehicles are talking about productivity tools, doing things in these spaces. And there's been a lot of talk even about entertainment centers. Maybe if I'm going clubbing on a Friday night, I might go with my mates on an autonomous vehicle for a drive all around East London, and I might play video games and have music and all kinds of stuff. And why bother a poor driver to do that when the autonomous vehicle can do it for me? Lots of opportunities to do things that we'd be embarrassed to ask the taxi driver to do. Do we, as part of the design process, go out and speak with the punters and check with them systematically where we lie on this axis? Lots of designers talk about the axis from utilitarian to hedonic, from A to B driving to driving my Ferrari through the Tuscany countryside, having the greatest holiday in my life. There's such a thing in life as doing stuff, and there's such a thing in life as enjoying yourself and expressing yourself. And everything we buy, everything we use, every day of our lives, we're making choices which place us on this scale. Well, the different metaphors for the vehicle actually land in different places. And the vast majority of the businesses making autonomous vehicles, if you were to ask them, the CEO, as I do quite regularly, where are you trying to place your vehicle? Is it more on this end towards the sensory and the enjoyment? Or is it literally, we don't care, it's just a box because we're just going, the X45 will take us from A to B? Most of the time, the business doesn't have an answer because the question is still about the technology, whether we can do it or not quite often. They're not actually asking this question yet. And then once you've got the metaphor, You've also got the ability, as most people in the room will be familiar with, I'm sure most of you in a, your everyday life to some degree are exposed or using scenarios, personas, and so forth. Well, it's not particularly complex to imagine if as a business we said our autonomous car is not 100% inclusive, is for a specific group of people with a specific requirement, and that's the metaphor that best meets that. Once we've taken this step and ticked this box as an innovation process, as a design process, as a UX activity, we can move on to identifying the relative personas the relevant personas that can help us to simplify some decisions, empathize, understand, feel for the person who's going to be in that product. And then we can look at some key scenarios. 
you know, another question you have is what's the scenario? You know, I've had conversations with businesses such as Motability where they're asking me, well, what's it going to be like running up the M1 at 80 miles an hour? And I'm like, is that what your average customer does with your Motability vehicle? You run up the M1 or are you actually going locally to do some things that you have to do? There's a real question about which of the scenarios which are so critical, they're going to bring out all the issues related that have to be right about that design. Scenarios which are not relevant to that bloke in this particular metaphor are probably not going to get us very far in terms of making a better design or worse design for the vehicle. We have to identify those make or break scenarios which will help us. And once we do that, scenarios can go to various levels of depth. We all use scenarios every day. Scenarios can be as simple as a few lines, some imagery, and some imagery which conjures emotions and helps us to feel what the person is feeling in that particular driving scenario, in that mission, in that context. It can be as simple as that, or it can be as complex as some of the studies of the academic nature in the literature, where every single step, every five to ten seconds of the process, there's a check and there's an activity. Taxi is traveling, confirm the drop-off, car is stopped, and so forth. You can break it down to any degree of fine comb, fine toothing of it. You can get very, very detailed, hyper detailed, or you can get a bit simple. But the fact is, one way or the other, you do need to ask yourself, those key personas, they might be as few as five to seven, in those five or ten critical, fundamental missions for that particular metaphor with that vehicle, with that name and that degree of anthropomorphism, what are the different steps in the UX process that will define whether this is a frictionless experience, an enjoyable experience, something you'd like to do again, or whether there's some step in there which you feel everything was really nice except that, that made me feel bad, I don't think I want to do it again next week fundamental for the design process. And then finally, finishing up, and I hope I'm ahead of time here, finishing up, there's then the human factors. And apologies to the human factors ergonomic society. I'm a fellow of the society, so I apologize deeply for not having put more slides in the presentation. But the reason I've left the human factors for the end is just to say, as fundamental as it is, and it might be the majority of the work we actually do to get the platform to work properly, as fundamental as it is, we can't ignore the fact that human factors in ergonomics has a hundred years or more of history. We've had the Ergonomic Society from the late 20s. In the 1950s it was a royal charter, 1954, 56, whatever it was. So we've got an enormous amount of the science of humans what a person can see, what a person can push, what a person can do, how fast they walk, what they like, how sounds affect people, motion sickness, which is a big issue with autonomous, you know, human factors experts and universities such as Loughborough and Nottingham and, and Cambridge and others, we've got a vast amount of information. Just googling stuff on the internet, you're overwhelmed sometimes by the tables and the data. So there's a lot there. And in many ways, that's not the bit that most businesses are getting wrong or getting totally wrong. That's the bit that actually should be straightforward. And there's lots and lots of good publications. For example, in the automotive industry, it's very common to use books like this by Mr. Bizet, who came from General Motors in the 1970s, 1980s. You know, take a look at the chapters in this hand great big handbook with lots of useful data. Introduction to automotive occupant packaging, driver data acquisition, field of vision, lighting, external vision, internal vision, workloading, cognitive, uh, comfort on seats and actuation of buttons and pedals and so forth. So we have a vast knowledge of the science of people the maths of people, what, make, what people can do and they can't do, how fast they do, how quickly your muscles wear out, how fast your vision sinks at night when it gets dark and so forth. What we often don't have were the early parts of this presentation. How did we choose the name? What was the metaphor? Did we actually choose a scenario that, that's critical for that one? Or, or, or do these things don't line up? The name, the metaphor, the, the scenario, whatever, they're not actually all relevant to the same design. And that's the bit that quite often is not really handled. So summing up, I would just say there's an elephant in the room which is very rarely discussed. And in the UK, as I said at the beginning, I do think of all the countries around the world, we're probably currently, from a year or two ago, in the lead 
in terms of getting autonomous platforms out there, getting the regulation. I was talking to someone from CCAV today about the ethics. They're going to have proper white papers out in the next few months on the ethics of autonomous platforms and some of the things we've discussed today will be discussed in these uh, white papers. So the businesses are ramping up monies are being deployed, the catapults are on it, the guidelines and the guidebooks and the British standards in place, which I don't think there's another one anywhere else. So we're a bit ahead of the game, but there still are a lot of doubts, a lot of question marks. And I think one of the elephants in the room is this one. For example, this morning on the telephone, the gentleman who's head of ethics at CCAV was saying to me, we as government, we as Department for Transport, we're very reluctant to talk in our documents about the autonomous vehicle being a robot or an intelligent, sentient device at some point in the future, because then people would delegate too much of the safety systems and the critical workload issues to the machine. And, and the discussion was, yes, you're absolutely right, but Either way you do it, are we getting all the ducks in a row? Are we ticking all the, did, did we do from A to Z, from the name all the way to the interface buttons and the menu options which have to meet ergonomic requirements? Did we get them all lined up to be this or that? And then did we give it the name? Did we identify which one or two key meanings? Is this going to be the Ferrari for driving through Tuscany or is this going to be the thing to get us to the workshop on Monday morning at 9 a.m.? And to what degree? Did we line up the metaphor? And metaphors aren't always uh, fundamentally part of the product design or the service design specification in many businesses. Then did we get the UX interactions clearly defined in place? Did we then look at the human factors and make sure everything is working properly. And thank you very much.